talk is sponsored by the English Department Speaker Fund. And we're just going to talk for about, I know some of you are going to class next, so we're going to talk for about 40 minutes. We'll have about 20 minutes for questions and so on, which will give everybody lots of time to uh, dash across campus or whatever. So um, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm way over-prepared, which means I'm way under-prepared, uh, and I'm going to be jumping around this presentation a bit, um, and I, I, I guess what I'm uh, trying to approach and define here is the nature of Irish as an urban language, um, and I keep on having to remind myself, don't go down that tangential side road, because I'm going to get lost in exciting things that in fact aren't going to be very helpful for the main thrust of this paper. Now, uh, question number one is, does an urban Irish language community exist? Uh, question number two would be, how sustainable is it if it exists? And question number three would be, what uh, uh, is the prognosis for this community down the road? So. Um, uh, let's see, um, how many of you have taken an Irish language class? Most, that's fantastic, well, at least half of you anyway. Um, now the problem with the Irish language as an urban phenomenon has as much to do with the geography of Ireland as anything else. Any of you who have taken the early Irish lit or the early, the early Irish history class will know that uh, um, early Irish towns simply don't exist. Um, if Hello, Fred. How are you? Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Fred is on the floor here. There's an empty chair right there. That's quite all right. There are many people. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> the, sorry, I was surprised there by a, a, a Kalamazoo face. <laughs> um, uh, there's very little um, archaeological evidence of any large conurbations in Gaelic Ireland. In fact, the first real towns we find in Ireland are founded by the Vikings and Norse, who were arriving from the 9th and 10th centuries on. Um, the, these include towns that are well known to you, Dublin, Waterford, Wexford, Limerick, and Cork, uh, and several others. Um, these were not, by their, by their very nature, these were not Irish-speaking towns. These were not Gaelic-speaking towns. Although we do have some intriguing evidence that the Norse of Dublin began to speak Irish. So, for instance, we have the well-known uh, last great king of Dublin, Olaf Curon. Curon is the Irish Gaelic for sandals. Um, and uh, who was the other fellow? Um, oh, there was a fellow who had the nickname Gloom Dove, Black Knees. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> These were names given to them by the Dublin North themselves. So we know there were some Irish being spoken there. But uh, in the 12th century, with the arrival of the Normans, that put paid to that. And the Normans again founded more towns. But these towns, if they spoke anything at all, it was English or French. Uh, most likely English. Um, oh, my slides. slides. I'm going to jump back a step here, because this is where I, went to, I intended to start. Your view of Ireland, I've no doubt about this. And it's something that's been pushed by the Irish state for several decades, indeed since the foundation of the Irish state, is that Irish Gaelic is this rural phenomenon. It's an isolated community in these marked, legally marked areas called the Gaeltacht. Um, and these are, of course, non-urban. Uh, the closest to towns you get is probably the Connemara Gaeltacht here and the Waterford built us to Dungarvan, but they've had almost no effect on the language patterns in the towns themselves. Um, there's a problem with this view, however, and that is that in the last 10 or 20 years, it's, it's changing. I just want to rattle you out of your, out of your um, assumptions about the language with the opening credits to a series that ran uh, last year year on uh, T.G. Cahill, the Irish language TV station. Um, can I make this do that stuff? Let's just take a look. <laughs> I'm not 
Um, where's the comfortable fireside chats with the Shanachi? Uh, I'll give you a, another even weirder phenomenon. This fellow's from New York. Uh, he's a comedian and he's performing in um, Australia. Of course, Australia, why not? In Gaelic. <laughs> Thanks for watching Spits and Specs. My name's Adam Hills. Good night, Australia. Okay, everyone, please don't be afraid to get into this as much as possible. And don't forget the Irish word for jump is lame. So when I say lame, I'm not saying wow, this is really lame. I'm saying jump without jumping. You know what I'm saying. Here we go. Do the club, do the bail. Ace, name is Gail. What happened to good ticket to the top? could have Time they go, who are bro? Can't go down the slide, bro? Tell you what the beach of Dice on the tower. Shoosty, boosty, from the bumper, boosty. Not be the flight, but they hunt us and like them. Kneel it, a theory. I ain't stickling the cock, bro. Downstairs, downstairs, got an ace, bro. Bookily, come on, that's probably fucking done. They fucking miss a large in the car this year. Come on, they ain't gonna tap your room. What? I'm one, jump in through one. Name in this, name in this, name in this, good one. We're passionate, huh? We're passionate, huh? Katrina Fodian down the bottom right there, <laughs> from uh, Krina Kille, the great novel. And, um, there's this, this whole rapping Irish language thing, it, it, it raises some important questions. Um, the first question is, does this really exist? Just because the opening credits of this very gritty urban drama are in Irish, the, the whole drama is in Irish, um, does the phenomenon of urban Irish really exist? Uh, or, as I say there, is it really just a slick attempt by second language speakers to boost an optional identity, uh, part-time second language culture while they actually continue to live English language lives? That is to say, is this the linguistic version of school children in the US using temporary tattoos and washout hair gels to be goths at the weekend? Um, if it is, does that matter? If the phenomenon of urban Irish is temporary, does that make it any less valid? You've all got online identities yourselves. Most of you under strange passwords like Punky Brewster 83 or something. <laughs> and this often allows you to play a character you might not normally be happy with. Um, is that character any less genuine than, uh, than a, 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 let's say, an, an everyday 24-hour life? Um, I asked that question. I'm not going to have an answer for it. Exactly. Um, but be that as it may. Uh, some statistics. Um, now these are not massaged, but maybe excessively positive. Uh, there's one and a half million people in the Republic of Ireland speaking Irish. Or are. Um, what's really happening there is there's one and a half million people who answered the yes-no question in the last census, can you speak Irish? And I said yes. Now on the other hand, I met a woman in the Chapelleur, which is the Conra Nagelge Irish language bookshop in Dublin last week, and she takes no, but she was speaking Irish to me. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, by my own reckoning, and this took a lot of statistical analysis, I guess there's about 367,000 people in the Republic alone uh, who have above average abilities in the Irish language. Uh, I'm not saying conversational. Uh, just because you have above average abilities in college Spanish doesn't necessarily mean that you can find the train station in Mexico City uh, in, in Spanish. 
Now, uh, a positive sign, I guess, is that somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000, and whenever I give you a range like this in this presentation, uh, I'm going to honestly suggest to you that the lower figure is probably the more accurate. Um, 100 to 200,000 native speakers are fluent second language speakers. That is, people who have no problem speaking the language. Um, now, fluency is a question and a problem because that doesn't necessarily mean that they are daily speakers or that it's a household language where they live. Um, it's just a gauge of their ability to speak Irish. Um, and I guess one of the problems that the state's being faced with at the moment is how do we transfer that latent ability into actual use of the language? Um, now, as a home phenomenon, as a, as a, as a, um, a phenomenon, uh, as a household language, Irish is being spoken by about 3,000 families in the Gaeltacht, which is a small enough number, but uh, while people moan and complain about this, it's actually fairly healthy and has held at about that level for 10 or 20 years now. Um, this is a much more interesting figure for me. There's 650 families outside the Gaeltacht raising kids in Irish. Now, 650 is actually a low ball. I think it's probably close to, closer to... Maybe I'm being excessively positive there. Um, now, in 1972, like I say, there was probably just about 60 families outside the Gaelic raising kids in Irish. This is a tenfold increase in 40 years. It's not bad, is it? It's not bad. It's still small. And the question, I, I'm, just, I'm just off a plane, by the way, I'm just off a plane from Dublin, so if I'm talking 100 miles an hour, it's because uh, jet lag has caught up with me. But I was speaking to several uh, families and parents and people who are participating in this community, and uh, there are several questions about those families. Are they actually raising functional speakers? And how do they self, um, how would they self classify? Uh, I had a very interesting conversation with a young man uh, raised through Irish and English in Dublin, now with a child of his own who has grave misgivings about what he's doing. He's trying to raise his child in Irish, but he's very nervous about it. Uh, he admitted to me he wasn't quite sure how to say, I love you. Irish to his child. How do you miss that if you're being raised through Irish? Well, Irish Catholic families, I think. <laughs> it's easy to miss. It's easy to miss. Um, I think the real problem about what is absent here is that he was, he was telling me this quite, uh, quite honestly, is that he associates the language or phrases like a store, a raw, a wurni, is who with things you read, with a non-real culture, things that you particularly had to read to pass state exams. And he can't get over the hurdle of naturalizing that language with his own child. And that's a major hurdle that's facing all the Irish language families. The majority, the vast majority of these 650 families are raising their, uh, have parents speaking Irish to kids uh, who themselves were not raised in Irish. I liken this situation to the state of Hebrew in the 1930s. It's newly revived. Uh, we're getting thousands of uh, immigrants from Russia, France, America, uh, um, Britain, and elsewhere. And they're suddenly being faced with raising their kids in this newly revived language without a working vocabulary for things like how to change diapers. Um, what do you do? And it's a, it's a problem that hasn't really been, um, uh, hasn't been addressed. Now, the other sector is Irish medium education. By the 1970s, uh, education in Ireland had gone to pot. 
uh, education, Irish speaking education anyway, there were fewer than 10 Irish speaking schools uh, in Ireland in the early 1970s. I went to one of them. Uh, we're now well over 200. That's a 20 fold increase. <laughs> so we're seeing a phenomenon where um, the, the next question is. Why does it take a guy coming in on the bus from New Jersey to show you that it exists? Is this Daniel Corkery's Hidden Ireland all over again? Why is the Irish speaking community so well hidden? Um, again, I'm not sure I'll have an answer for that. Now, let's go back to the, 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 the history of the language that I was telling you about. I think I've got as far as the Normans, uh, which normally takes me about two hours, so I'm doing fairly well here. Um, uh, did my slides come over? I think they did. Well, there's um, Gaelic and North Ireland. You can see the North settlements there. Um, the Normans arrive, founding more uh, establishments uh, like Athlone, Athenry, Kilkenny, particularly, of course, we all know about Kilkenny. Um, about the only part of Ireland that remains unanglicised under the Normans, as you can see, is the northern half here, uh, under the leadership of the Inail and the O'Donnells. Um, and even that collapsed once Henry VIII decided he liked the look of that island off to the west, and it was very uh, aggressively planted under his successors, Mary Elizabeth and James. Really, all that was left was Connacht, and with the flight of the Earls in 1603, there was no Gaelic government anymore to found towns. So any towns that were established, established even in Connacht, after the, after the 16th century, were founded by the English. So we have, we're into the modern era, we're solidly into the modern era, the 17th and 18th centuries, and there are no Irish-speaking towns in Ireland. And yet, up until the mid-19th century, well more than 50% of the population of Ireland was Irish speaking. This is why, by the way, that you, particularly Americans, by the way, associate the Irish language with rural, pre-modern culture. Because the only Irish speakers lived outside the towns. Um, um, any of you who are Irish Americans are probably the descendants of people who left in the 19th century. Uh, when uh, the Irish hadn't even been mooted as an urban phenomenon. Uh, so, um, very often Irish people have to fight with the stereotypes of Irish Gaelic culture coming from abroad, from, from the UK and the US. Um, in any case, things began to improve in the late 19th century. The Society for the Preservation of the Irish Language was founded in... Um, I want to say the 1870s, I think it was 1873, I'm not certain about that. Um, and they were eager to revive the language, but you can see the problem already. They're reviving the language as a second language, not as a first language. Um, they issued a, well, they edited a number of old texts, but they also issued a series of primers in the Irish language. And these primers, as you can see, are directed at English speakers. Um, and in the late 19th century, anybody who had English and could read was unlikely to have any interest in this. They probably only got ever several hundred, maybe a few thousand people into their classes or buying their primers. Um, and while it was a laudable uh, Movement. I'm not sure what effect it had, apart from raising the the uh, profile of the language, which isn't a bad thing. Um, okay, I'm going to slip into the 1920s. Now I'm going to slip into the modern age, actually, and back to the 20s. Um, Irish as an urban phenomenon has really experienced a, a revival, but particularly since the foundation of the Irish Free State in 1922. Um, and probably one of the best examples of urban support for the language is actually Dublin, nerve centre of the old enemy. Uh, it's very interesting to see how much Irish you will see 
on, in, in public places around Dublin, almost all public signage is in Irish and English. And while it used to be off, that is to say the Irish was jokey Irish, which had been translated by a chimpanzee in a darkened room using a 200-year-old dictionary. Um, there have been very serious moves to uh, make it a working urban language now. And uh, I'm quite happy with what I see. Uh, <laughs> one small error, but uh, I'll take that. I'll take that. Uh, and I, uh, I'm involved in an online Irish language translators group, and most of our work involves uh, translators having been given the contract to translate signs for new, new things in Sligo or Galway or Dublin. And very often we come up with terms that we have no term for. So, for instance, pooper scooper. <laughs> What's the Irish for pooper scooper? <laughs> Slushteen Kaka. I love it. <laughs> a little shit show. But <laughs> um, well it's, it's a fantastic sign, and uh, it does actually indicate something that uh, isn't clear. But groundswells are never obvious until the revolution has happened. So watch out. Gaddafi found that out. Hard way. Um, there, most of this signage is occurring because of a newly emboldened urban Irish language community putting pressure on the local authorities. I'll give you an example. For instance, just last week, the Urban District Council for Castle Bar wanted to put a brass plaque up in the train station honouring the, the people from Castle Bar who drowned on the Titanic. And they found out that it would cost twice as much to have the brass plaque cast in English and Irish. So they said, ah, to hell with it, we must have English. Do we all understand English? So several local politicians and language activists um, brought this to the intent attention of the language commissioner, who has only been around about eight years, I think, uh, who brought it to the council's attention that this was now illegal. And that brass plaque is now going to go up bilingually. And this makes a huge change from the 1970s when, without any rights at all for Irish speakers, most public signage went up monolingually. So that's a fantastic sign. It's, a, it's, a, it's encouraging. Um, I took that on the way out of the airport yesterday. Um, you won't see him, but there was a guard standing right there. Uh, I saw him because he came up to me. <laughs> he said, what are you doing taking pictures in airports? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> um, a friend was picking me up from the centre of Loch Ray in County Galway on Saturday. And he said, you know, Breen, you're a bit eccentric. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I passed you on the street and you were taking a picture of a PVC door. <laughs> it was not. <laughs> a picture of a sign in the door. He said, see? Eccentric. <laughs> he wasn't to know I was going to be here on Tuesday. Um, this is an extraordinary thing. Has anybody here heard of the Broad Club? It's this uh, um, Bernard Dunn is a very well-known Irish boxer who I think won an... an Olympic medal for Irish for boxing. <laughs> for boxing about five, six years ago, whenever the last Olympics was. And he's gone mad for the Irish language in the, in the last few years. And he started a TV show last month, Broad's Club, Use Your Coupla Fuckle, he says. Um, and uh, his goal is to get 100,000 Irish people learning Irish or reviving what Irish they have by the start of the summer. It's up to about 30,000 right now. This only started last month. This is fantastic. And this is all new people. So I found this quite by accident. Uh, my, I found out that my bank card didn't work. Uh, so I went into the bank and I found all these signs. I went up to the fellow behind the counter and I said, well, come to talk to I said. He looked at me and he had a Petrified look in his face, and he said, "Can I say, Peter Lum, how do you?" And he 
and I thought, should I try it? <laughs> well, Tom Horta as fine because Tom Nagir, if I ho oh, hold on, he says, well, what are you learning? <laughs> and I said, what's going on with all these signs? And he said, on Friday, every day, oh, sorry, every Friday, Bank of Ireland is promoting the language, and we're all putting these temporary signs out to encourage its use at the uh, at the tills. An extraordinary thing. <laughs> I found that quite by accident. Um, now again, this is mostly promotion of Irish as a second language. Um, um, now, let's jump back to a few statistics here. I'm keenly aware of the time as well, and I may need to jump over things. There's the growth in Irish language schools since 1972. We're about 10 here. Look at this. We're well over 200 by the year 2010. And they're still being founded. There are three or four more being opened this coming September. So it's an ongoing growth. That's the number of students attending Irish language schools. We're well over 40,000 at the moment. Um, uh, classifying speakers. I could spend a long time on that, and I won't. Let's see. Uh, I'm not going to speak about the Belfort community. You all know it exists. It's this officially recognized Irish-speaking area in the West <coughs> which the government has given lots of time and supposedly lots of money to for the speaking of Irish for the past 80 years or so, 90 years. Has it succeeded? That's another question. Um, the problem with Belfort speakers is that they're using the language isn't really, it's not something they're married to. The language is used as a marker of tribe. And I'd often find that if I go into the Gaeltacht, I will have the wrong dialect and they refuse to speak Irish with me because I don't speak their dialect. I'm not a member of their tribe. So there's all sorts of weird psychological things going on about Irish in the Gaeltacht. And I'm, uh, that's why I'm rather inclined not to talk about it today. I think psycholinguists and sociolinguists would have uh, would be able to give you a much better presentation um, on that. Uh, so jump over those that classification, and we'll jump onto the second language speakers. Um, uh, what do I have to say about that? Um, the government issued a 20-year plan for the Irish language, a 20-year strategy for the Irish language last year. The goal is to get, well, I can't remember, I think they wanted 300,000 native speakers inside 20 years or something. But the challenge is, of course, to get these people, and perhaps these also, to make the jump from occasional users of the language to home users of the language, so as to raise native speakers. Then we're on to the next stage. What do we do to care for those native speakers? Particularly, just as I was saying to Professor Burke right now, on the way over here, there is no linguistic work done on the acquisition of Irish amongst native speakers. In fact, I am pretty much the second scholar to be working in this area. The first, whose name is still escaping me, unfortunately, uh, started working this in the 1980s, but then drifted off to another field. So I'm pretty much the only person with any interest in seeing how Irish is acquired by kids in the home, particularly when the parents themselves are non-native speakers. Um, right, here's the real situation of the language in the cities. English is the default language in all of the cities, and even in parts of the country. Um, if we're to succeed in promoting the language, we've got to make Irish the default language in more places than this. It's encouraging to see that these places exist, but it's rather like being a homeless person or a drug addict. There are special Irish-speaking drop-in centres, <laughs> and so on. Um, um, so let's see. Where are they? Well, here's an example. Here is the Irish-speaking community. Here is where the d default Irish-speaking community of Dublin exists. What do you mean you don't see them? Okay, I'll zoom in. Do you still not see them? What do you mean you still don't see them? That's them right there. That's them. That's it. 
Uh, that's Harcourt Street, just south of, of Grafton Street, and it is pretty much the nerve centre of Irish language activity in Dublin City. And while it's a small, unassuming building, it's a very en encouraging centre. Uh, there's a bar slash nightclub down here. Uh, unfortunately, I feel like you're off to hell. <laughs> down these, these stairs to get in there. There's a very pleasant... Um, that's the children's play area where they have a, uh, a native-speaking children's play group that meets there several times a week. Unfortunately, uh, I was there on a Friday and they come on Saturdays usually. So it's, you know, it's a sign. It's a nice sign to see. Um, that's uh, uh, social activity going on in, in, the, in the club downstairs. Um, oh dear, I hadn't meant to put that in. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a slide and I'll go back a slide in a moment. This is the Cultural. It's in West Belfast. It's a converted Presbyterian church. And it was bought and done up specifically for the promotion of the Irish language in West Belfast. And uh, one thing they've been massively working hard to do is to separate the Irish language from the nationalist movement in the north of Ireland. It's still the case that you'll very often be accused of being a Shinner or an IRA activist if you speak Irish outside of the Gaelic. It is a political act outside of the Gaelic. Um, and Cultureland is a fantastic phenomenon, though. They have this wonderful restaurant in here. They have a, a, it can be converted into a, a theatre. There's a 24-hour radio station broadcasting up here. Um, there are offices of some Irish language support groups. And from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., there are children and adults flowing in and out of those doors. Now, the advantage Belfast has is that um, uh, um, it's a small city, and the Irish language community is indeed mostly confined to about a two square mile area around there. So it's easy to walk off to the culture and bring your kids along and have an Irish speaking play date with families elsewhere. Um, the Irish speaking community has existed in Belfast since the 1960s. One of the most encouraging things about it is the foundation of the Bober Shoige, Shaw's Road in Gaelpacht in the area. Um, They've been raising kids. They're now into their third generation there of raising kids in this tiny area. It's unofficial. It isn't officially recognized at all as an Irish-speaking area. And all the families on this one street speak Irish. Um, and they're obviously central to this thing as well. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little thing. I know you're all pressed for time. I'm supposed to speak for I, 40. No, I think another 10 minutes is good, right? Another 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, if you, if you, show you. If that is okay, if you have enough time. Show you a very brief introduction to the culture, um, and I particularly want you to see Owen O'Neill. One of the problems with Irish language activists is they're sometimes excessively enthusiastic, and the problem is you're uh, likely to say that's not true. And this is exactly what happens. Your policy of Cultural and Macadam of Fee attracts both the Irish-speaking community and those from home and abroad with an interest in Irish language and culture. With a restaurant, cafe, it is an ideal stop-off for travellers and backpackers. And often Falsha, the tourist information point, offers a bilingual service to its visitors, which includes helping to arrange accommodation and providing information on places of interest and events around the city. And Hoshlum is at the centre of a growing Irish language community in Belfast Gale Talk Quarter. It is situated in the former Broadway Presbyterian Church, which closed in the 1980s as the Protestant community declined following the outbreak of the Troubles. It is appropriately named to honour Robert Shipboy McAdam and Cardinal Thomas O'Flynn, men from very different backgrounds and traditions sharing a common love of the Irish language. Belfast-born Robert McAdam, a Presbyterian businessman who owned Soho Foundry on the modern peace line between the Shaikh linguist and his special study of Irish. Uh, a fluent speaker, he pioneered the... Uh, I want to show you Manchon Magan, who was a known troublemaker. Uh, Manchon questions the phenomenon of Irish as a national language in Ireland. 
and you know, he, he made this wonderful series about eight years ago, maybe seven years ago, where he drove around Ireland refusing to speak English. So when his car broke down in Dundalk, uh, he called up all of the local garages and insisted that the mechanic speak Irish to him. And my God, the mechanic could speak Irish. It was an amazing thing. But the point of this series is more that there's a lot of fakery going on with the language. O officially, constitutionally, it's the first language of the state, but um, real in reality, um, there's, well, you'll find reality in a moment. The both the ball, the see there's a significant difference between what Owen O'Neill would claim and the reality that Moncon finds out on the streets. Now but on the other hand he does find several Irish speakers who try and I guess that's one of the problems. Loads of people who have taken classes. The transfer to pre spoken Irish, to, to being able to speak it, is a massive change and we're not seeing that quite yet. As you can see there's a bit of attitude as well towards, how dare you push your Irish on me, um, which you would never find if people were speaking English, because English is the urban default. Um, now, on the other hand, knowing that Irish as a physically existing on the streets phenomenon is fairly hard to find and it causes friction and so on, the Irish language community have gone around the problem and we're seeing increasingly uh, a gigantic rise in the language as a virtual 
phenomenon. And I've, I've no problems with that. Um, what do I have to say about this? Um, oops. Uh, the foundation of an Irish language TV service in the 1990s changed everything. You all of a sudden had this fantastic children's TV service. And I certainly, I have to speak for myself, I see that Irish speaking kids have a much higher standard of Irish than they would have had in the 1970s. Problem being, of course, that the existence of a single Irish language TV station is much outweighed by the fact that in the 1970s there was only a single TV station in Ireland broadcasting for about seven hours a day. Uh, now, uh, well, I'll give you an example. One of my best friends, who's an Irish speaker, was out in Rosseville in the Connemara Belt last weekend installing a satellite dish for his father. That's 300 English speaking channels right there. So you're going to have kids with access to a single Irish language TV service and two or three hundred English language stations. How do you combat that? I don't know. On the other hand, the, there's a very encouraging sign, particularly in the cities, um, and I draw your attention particularly to Radio Na Liffe, the Dublin-based Irish language radio station, and Radio Forza, the Belfast-based Irish language radio station, broadcasting on the internet and on FM to those communities. These are proof of the existence of Irish language communities and proof of the need for Irish language media. Um, and they're proof that people, once they close the front door of their house, are speaking Irish inside. How do we get it outside the front door, however? And that's a question in the Gaelic too that hasn't been answered. Uh, I could talk about the print media and the internet, but I know time is going to run away with me unless I proceed at great speed. Um, Irish as a virtual phenomenon. <clears throat> There's loads of events, particularly in, in Dublin, but I don't think you could say that the that Irish language centre in Harcourt Street in Dublin functions in the same way that the Cultureland does in West Belfast. And this has been one of the great challenges for the Irish speaking community in Dublin, which is a large city. It's about the size of Milwaukee. So many of the Irish-speaking um, families live in housing estates on the edge of the city. They might be the only speaking family in the housing estate. The next Irish-speaking family might be several miles away. Do you really want to go out in the rain, the lashing rain of November for an Irish-speaking play date with people over there? Do you really want to drive into the center of the city? And anyone here who has driven in Dublin knows exactly what I'm talking about for the, the possibility of a playgroup. Yeah. It's happening, but Dublin needs to address this problem and it hasn't been addressed yet, which means the Irish-speaking events that occur, occur peripatetically, mostly in clubs that have been hired specifically for the job, uh, but these clubs would be normally English-speaking clubs. Uh, the the latest example is on Cabaret Krakowitz, the crazy cabaret, which is held every two weeks or so. It pulls in hundreds of Irish speakers from all over the city, but it's held at a different bar, a different club every time. Uh, oh yeah, one of the real positive signs here is the students' nights, uh, which are, aren't Thursdays anymore, Tuesdays apparently. The students go out and get bombed on Tuesdays. Uh, I was amused that you can get Jaeger bombs translated into Irish uh, for 10 euro. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. I want to talk to you a uh, little about my, my linguistic analysis of urban Irish. Uh, I'm going to be publishing this in a few months. Um, now, I'm not going to have the time to explain the phonetics to you as I want to look at that. Oh my god. Uh, okay. Shave. All Irish consonants are subject to mutation. So, uh, ku, which is Irish for hound, can become hu, or it can become gu, depending on context. So, shevu is when it, 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 ku becomes hu. Oru is when ku becomes gu. 
and uh, then you could also slenderize consonants. Now what I wanted to do was to compare the phonetics of urban speakers with the phonetics of Gueltacht speakers, those in the far west. And uh, so what I did was I, I identified a few obvious markers of Irish, things that you would only find in Irish and that are necessary for Irish grammar to succeed. That is to say, um, these aren't just random changes of sound. These sounds mark grammatical changes like past tense or plurality or whatever it might be. If they're not being made, the grammar is being affected. So you can see it's going to have an effect on the language. So I chose several markers. I don't have time to go through these. So I'll just, uh, and I marked up texts. And uh, I was also interested in just the plain old grammar. Uh, give you an example, how do words change? In English, there are only 18 possible changes. There is an eight, I can't remember. Is it eight or 18? 18. You can only make eight changes to English words. That's it. Present tense, past tense, plurality, uh, and comparative and superlative in the adjectives. I think that's it. Um, in Irish, there are several hundred words. So this single word, kainzor, which means speaker, can change in any of these ways. It can become gainzor, kainzor, kainzor, and so on. And each of these has a particular grammatical f function. Now, uh, okay, some tactical analysis. I could spend a long time talking about this, and I'm not. What I was, I'm not going to. What I was interested in was, could urban speakers produce sophisticated grammatical clauses, particularly sub-clauses, in the same way that Gaeltacht speakers could. Uh, we'll find out in a moment. Uh, there's an example of one, there's an example of syntactic analysis. On we go, lexical measurement. I couldn't do semantic analysis. I still haven't found a yardstick for it. So the closest I could get was word count and lexical measurement. We'll see now how they, how they, how they uh, sized up. Gaeltacht speakers missed a maximum of 11% of their phonetic features. Urban speakers were anywhere between 38 and 46. This is having a massive... You, you understand what's going to happen here. Urban grammar is going to have to change. If you can't mark a plural in Irish because you haven't got the pronunciation, how are you going to mark plurals? So we're at a very significant tipping point in the language. Same thing for the second category, 4 to 10 percent in the girls, 33 to 50 percent in the cities. Um, the the palatals were extraordinary, 0 to 4 percent. The girls, 50 to 88 percent. Extraordinary change, extraordinary. Um, gr grammatical changes. Gaeltacht speakers made 5 to 7 percent errors, which is perfectly average within st statistical norms. Urban speakers, anywhere between 26 and 50, and 71 percent errors. 71 percent errors! <laughs> <laughs> Even the newsreaders were at 35 percent. Extraordinary. Um, now, I'll show you this huge graph more to show you how variable the error rate is in the urban areas. Um, let me see. Dub there's a Dublin newsreader who makes 20% errors in nouns, but then we have another one who makes 40% errors in nouns. We have chat shows in the cities making 77 and 82%. What does this suggest? It suggests that urban Irish is a very unstable dialect, if it's a dialect at all. Some speakers are making 30% of errors, some speakers are making 80% of errors. This is not on. It's making communication between speakers very hard. Because you never know what to expect from your interlocutors. Uh, so there's going to be an added a couple of seconds. There I am thinking of Irish. An added several seconds in every sentence while you figure out, was that an error? Or did the speaker actually mean what she was saying? Um, syntactic results 
urban speakers are making many more errors in the formation of clauses. Is this a bad thing? I don't know. They're still making as many subclauses. Question is, is it okay to make an error? One of the problems with standardized Irish is it was standardized by purists 50 years ago, indeed 100 years ago. Is it simply the case that urban Irish is drifting away from that pure Irish and that a new urban dialect is forming? Question number two, is this a legitimate dialect? I don't know if I can answer that yet. Um, interestingly, I was expecting a simplified urban lexicon, but they have about the same vocabulary as speakers from the Gaelic. That's, that's, that's an interesting finding as well. Uh, my conclusions, the phonetics is being very seriously affected mostly under the influence of English. That is to say, urban Irish sounds, is increasingly sounding more English than Irish. And this is having an expected knock-on on the morphology. Uh, and the knock-on is causing a very uh, significant simplification of Irish grammar. Um, slightly higher error rate in the formation of subclauses, and I think that that category, the syntactic category, might be the most important, uh, but it's also the hardest to measure, which is the reason I have it on the back burner. Uh, I'm starting a proper analysis of that soon. We'll see what happens. Uh, and there's no obvious simplification of lexicon in urban Irish. Um, so the bad news, if you're a second language speaker of Irish from a city, you're probably speaking a pigeon. I hate the word. We all hate the word. It sounds terrible. And, you know, I've, I've been lambasted on the radio, on live radio, for <coughs> using the word, of what is a pigeon? A pigeon is an agreed upon simplified language used by non-natives of that language. And that's exactly what's going on with English speakers in the city who are gathering of a Tuesday night to speak Irish. They're speaking a sort of a pigeon. They're agreeing to speak Irish for the night. Um, among most of the first language speakers, it's a sophisticated creole. What's a creole? A creole is a pidgin that has developed native speakers. Uh, and what's interesting about urban Irish is, as I said, we've seen a tenfold increase in urban speakers in the last 30 or 40 years, most of them with non-native parents. Where are those kids picking up their Irish? From the parents. Now the question is, is that creole going to tend back to the so-called pure Gaelic of Irish, or is it going to remain its own dialect? My initial analysis of them is, suggests that the phonetics remains much the same, but that they develop a much higher syntactic sophistication. So I think we're looking at what at, at the beginnings of a new urban dialect of Irish. It's going to take another generation. But it is there and coming. Um, so, urban Irish exists, I conclude, uh, but in two forms. One, it's in this second language pigeon form, uh, which I think has a lot to do with this chosen second identity that people have. On Saturday night, I'm off to speak Irish. Uh, this, it's growing, but as you saw from my statistical analysis, it's unstable and it's still quite unrooted. And then there's the first language form, and it's again growing. It's, uh, as I say here, it's suffering from significant attrition, the problem being that the kids grow up with Irish as such a normal phenomenon that they don't care about it. So they marry out of the community quite happily. It's, 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 it's just a marker of their family rather than a marker of national identity or a marker of cultural identity. Um, now, as long as the urban default remains English, this culture is going to remain very hidden. Um, that is to say, you're going to walk past hundreds of speakers on the street, uh, Irish speakers on the street, in Dublin without knowing that they're Irish speakers because the default language in every shop, every store, every office is going to be Irish unless it's a very obviously marked place. Um, and I mentioned that thing about commitment to Irish speaking culture, can often lead participants to overstate the culture's size, but that does not conversely mean that it 
doesn't exist at all. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for your attention. And before we get into questions and answers, I'd also like to thank a few people in the room. You were surprised when about half the people put up their hands and then it's an Irish language. I was delighted to see yeah, you. Yeah. That is down to Brendan King, who started an Irish language club, uh, Fred Biggs, who's, who's taught old Irish, and through their work, they brought the Fulbright instructor in Irish to UConn the first time. That's cool enough, Lawrence, in the corner. Coon, um, do you want to say a few words about the next class you're teaching, just in case you might, you might recruit? Uh, yeah, <laughs> So thank you to Brian, but thank you also to creating an audience for this talk for me. Uh, I think you have loads of amazing questions here, so who'd like to start? Um, yes, Brad! <laughs> <laughs> Bullshit. The language has always been changing. How can you come in with words like error and pigeon ah. and legitimate? <laughs> I mean, can, 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 really? Are, do you really want to create this to move in that direction? Uh, look at old to middle to the history and development of the language. A glorious history of embracing change and you know being excited about these things. I love the talk, obviously, and brilliant. And thank you. But really, at the end, are you sure you want to set up? Yes. I are you nice sure you want question. morphological proof of the purity of the language? What kind of a linguist are you? <laughs> thank you, friend. I would only take that from a friend. <laughs> I wouldn't take him from an ex-friend, Fred. <laughs> uh, no, Fred's absolutely right. Um, I, I, well, I, I don't know, can I say this out loud, but I'm not too fond of the purists. I'm not much of a purist myself. I think purists have done more damage to the language than they have. Well, the spelling system, for um, example. <laughs> now, uh, the... What I find, number one, about the purists is most of them are second language speakers, and they're enthusiasts, and they want desperately for there to be this pure form of the language back in the Weltacht. But when it comes to actually speaking at home in Dublin or Cork or Belfast, they back off a bit, um, mostly because they have deified the language so much that they're afraid they're going to get it wrong when they speak it at home. Uh, so I have only, but I have only the highest respect for people who say, "Screw the purists! I'm going to raise my kids in Irish anyway." You're right. I shouldn't have used the word error. Um, I should probably have used something like non-normative, uh, <laughs> non-standard, non-standard, original, brilliant, no, new, uh, <coughs> innovative. The the. Um, I liken Irish, I liken the current situation of Irish to the situation of English about the time of Chaucer or in the immediately preceding generation. This is a language of no prestige. If you want prestige, you speak Norman French. Uh, and all of a sudden, and it's about Chaucer's generation, a large number of speakers of English in England say, hang on a minute, I like using French. And I don't much care for these uh, Anglo-Saxon grammatical endings. And uh, I quite like the idea of modal auxiliaries. I think I'll throw a few of them in. And I have no doubt that in the time of Chaucer there were purists out there who were saying, oh, so bad. French, where's the grammar? The grammatical endings are dying, it's on the pronunciation. These cockneys are, are saying things like car instead of car. Well, car is a bad example, but um, <laughs> they're, 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 they're they have their pronunciation of the French, they're taking on a French vocabulary, and they're simplifying the grammar. And I'm sure there are purists going, this Geoffrey Chaucer is going to destroy the English language. And instead, what do we have? We have the first great known poet in the English language. Uh, so I, we're, uh, we're on that point in Irish as well. Uh, the, one of the great problems with the Irish language is fear. I keep meeting people who are terrified. They're terrified they're speaking the wrong Irish with their kids. They're terrified a purist is going to overhear them on the bus. 
they're they're terrified uh, uh, that they are uh, polluting the language, and yet they persist. What a great sign! Um, we need to get the, that community a little prouder of the Irish they're speaking, which, as you quite rightly point out, is simply an adaptation and a mark of change. A language that stops changing is a dead language. And the, the only place where the language is changing and being used innov innovatively, innovative, innovative uh, is in the cities, I think, uh, and amongst young people uh, in general. So I think that um, I, I take back my use of the word error and I slot in non-standard instead, if that's okay. Just to follow up on that and your response, how might this compare to, um, say, English urban speakers? Um, you know, statistically, with a lot of the same kinds of changes going on, um, and English purists saying the same sorts of things as Quakers, how might this compare to other, and not just English, but any language urban um, changes? That is a magnificent question. And I thought there was a book published just now, now, there's a sort of a triumvirate of people who talk to me, but they don't necessarily agree with me and my findings on urban Irish. In fact, they don't want to acknowledge urban Irish. It's a, it's a pimple on the arse of pure Irish. Um, uh, they're, and they're decrying the use of words like yeah and okay and cool in, amongst teenagers in the Gaeltacht. They're saying this is a pollution of the language, that the, the abilities in the language are changing. And I thought to myself, hang on, English-speaking teenagers are doing the very same thing. And English-speaking adults and parents and purists are going, oh, it's the end of the language as we know it. It's dying. How can young people claim to speak this? <laughs> Truth is, number one, the more outrageous features of teenage slang they'll fall by the wayside now. Uh, the more acceptable features of teenage English will stay and be a part of the changed English lexicon. Um, the question is, I'm finding, I don't know if Fred is finding this, uh, or if, 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 if Mary is finding this, I'm finding a worrying lack of semantic sophistication amongst speakers of English these days. I don't know how it is amongst high-level students, such as those who find in stores, but 